What's up, Navigating Academia family? This is your buddy, Dr. J. Phoenix Singh, coming at you to be able to provide you with another video review. There's a lot of advice out there on how to be able to get into graduate school, how to be able to get postdocs, ACE interviews, so on and so forth. And one thing that I thought would be fun is to be able to try a little mini-series where I watch some of these and give you my feedback in real time. Keep in mind that always, we deeply want to be respectful to other content creators. So if you really enjoy their content, please do take a second not only to be able to go and visit their landing page on YouTube, subscribe to their channel, hit that like button on their videos as well. It's really important that we all we all follow and support each other in this whole thing. It's really important. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan, as you guys know, of kind of going and bashing other content creators and these things. I really think it's inappropriate. It's one of the reasons why I've never done this kind of a video in the past. Uh, but I'm making a few of them now. You guys can let me know simply by watching the videos if you like them or not, and if you think that they're actually worthwhile. So today's video that we're going to be looking at together is called Getting Into a Clinical Psychology PhD Program Advice from a Professor. And the content creator here is... Dun -dun 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 -dun, Dr. Rita Walker. Excellent. Dr. Walker, thank you so much for taking the time to make this video as well. I'm sure you got a million things going on, as is everybody else, and I really appreciate you personally and giving us the opportunity under fair use to be able to take a look at your wonderful video. So let's go ahead, guys, and first let's go ahead and like this video, which is important. Okay, just show some love. Let's go ahead, let's watch, and uh, I'll go ahead and pause and give you guys any feedback that I have got. Here we go. Hi, I'm Dr. Rita Walker and I am a psychology professor. I earned my PhD in 2002 and I've been a university professor since that time. And I'm making this video because I get a number of emails from uh, prospective students around the country that I don't always get to respond to even though I do my best. But I think it's important to offer my perspective as a professor for getting admitted into a doctoral program in clinical psychology. Or at least Respect to Dr. Walker. Good job. An APA accredited program mm -hmm. in clinical psychology. Perfect. Remember, guys, not every program is APA accredited. If you're not sure which ones are or not, go on to Google, type in APA accredited clinical psychology PhD programs or PsyD programs. There is a little search kind of widget that the website has, right? And basically you can go to it and you can search literally for every single one that actually is accredited right now, okay? And you want to make sure that just because a program is a PhD in clinical psych doesn't necessarily mean it's APA accredited. And even though it is APA accredited on the website of the official university, you want to make sure that it's not like pending approval and you also in my opinion unless it's a really big name school if it's a smaller school that maybe you don't know of you haven't heard of it so much you always want to go and make sure that you take a look at when the next APA site visit is which is the next time that basically APA is going to reevaluate whether or not this given institution is APA accredited in terms of their program or not if it's too close and you have the choice between one where hey Site visit is way off the next one versus another one. Uh-oh, it's next year. Something that you may want to take into consideration, all other things being equal. For those of you who may not know, getting into clinical psychology PhD programs is oftentimes more challenging than getting into medical school. In the program where I am, as an example, we get about 400 applications per year, and we admit maybe 8 to 12 students per year. Okay, so, you know, let's just, let's cut the difference, right, so, and just say 10, right, so here we're dealing with, again, usually I always tell you guys that, you know, traditionally, and this was made pre-COVID, that we're at about 4% or so, right, uh, or below. Some programs are a little bit higher, especially if you go into something like counseling psych PhDs instead of clinical psych PhDs. But really now, because of COVID, last year was absurd, as we've talked about on the channel, of where we're usually dealing with like something like, what, 0.5 to 2%, depending on the program. Uh, and especially with a lot of budgets being slashed, it's something where even folks who used to take multiple students a year, now they can take significantly fewer, okay? So something that really uh, the doctor here is 100% correct about. So respect to her for pointing that out, even as a faculty member. And so students email me because they want to have a sense of what do they need to do in order to be more competitive. And one thing I will say, I think there are some students who may not have a sense that when you are asked to indicate the faculty member who you're interested in working with, that that's not something to be taken casually. And I will say I don't see it a lot, but I do see it enough that it seems that students will 
indicate wanting to work with me, but they haven't done any work or there isn't anything in their statement or their research statement or their statement of interest that indicates that they are invested in that area of work. Oh my God, preach, preach. Let me, let me give the little uh, the little bow here. Uh, oh my gosh, you know, it's one of these things like I do the whole taps thing, bam, ba ba, because this is like a death knell. Uh, if you guys know, you know, I just, what, last week I posted this video about like top five red flags when it comes to, uh, to applications, to PhD applications. And this is a huge one, which is in the personal statement and nowhere else in your application materials, establishing a very strong goodness of fit, right? With not just the target program, people focus, especially for PhD programs, way too much on the program. Oh, but the name of the program is so prestigious. Oh, but it's an Ivy League. It's these things. Guys, no one cares. What we care about for PhD programs is the goodness of fit between you and the target supervisor. The target supervisor is the one who's really going to make the call. You see the look in her face when she says she makes a great point. When she says she gets the application materials and it's clear that these folks who are applying and say, I want to work with her, they haven't done any background work on that. Right? They don't know the work that she's done. They don't know what grant she's got. They don't know what conferences she goes to, what her lab's mission is anything like that, right? They probably don't have a fundamental sense of the research literature in terms of her niche that she specializes in. This is infuriating and not just infuriating, it's disappointing. And as she says, right, it's not something common, but when she does see it, it's not good. And this is why it was one of my red flags. So let me take a step back. Um, a number of videos that have been made talking about this, and it's not to be taken lightly that GPA is important, GRE is important. And so a student is going to have a much easier time getting into a doctoral program when their GRE is closer to 3.8 than when it's closer to 3.0 or lower. For she means GPA, not GRE. For GREs, you know, having a GRE that's closer to the mean, that is 50th percentile, is going to make, make it really very challenging to get into a PhD program. That is only true if you take a look at the specific program you want to get into. You find out what their average and what their median, preferably median IQR scores are for the last several cohorts. That'll give you a better sense than just being at, let's say, the 50th percentile. So, for example, if you're in the 90, 90th percentile, but if you take a look at the median percentiles or whatever that people have scored on the GRE for the last several cohorts, they're all 95 Okay, well, that's not great, even though you're way above the 50th percentile, okay? Um, and that's not to say that all programs are, are equal and that one cannot get admitted to any program. I'm just saying that the odds are less in your favor if you're not closer to the upper um, quartile of individuals who are applying. Um, one thing that I don't think the students necessarily know is that for APA-accredited programs, you can go to that program's website and there is published data with regard to, I think, the last five admission classes of what the average GRE and what the average GPA is. And so that information is readily available on websites. For sure. And APA even does you a huge favor now, which is that if you use that search engine I mentioned earlier, when you bring up a little pop-up or whatever of a given program you're interested in learning more about, it'll give you the link to the website that she's talking about, the landing page on that program's website, which has that information, which is awesome. The other part that I think that, you know, regardless, sometimes I won't say regardless, but is as important, if not more important, than GRE and GPA, and those are research experience and fit to the person that you're interested in working with. And so in these APA accredited programs, they tend to subscribe to a mentor model. And so what that means is students are admitted to work with a specific faculty member. So yes, you're admitted into a program, but you have to be admitted with someone who is going to be the major professor or advisor or mentor. And so to be admitted to work with that person, you have to have some research experience in the area that is that person's expertise. That one I have to respectfully completely disagree with. Uh, that's not just not just not true for me in terms of my background of not having had experience in that area. Uh, but the preponderance of individuals that I, I assist in getting into programs annually, uh, you do not. If you're interested in looking into you know something in schizophrenia, right, and your work is all in depression, that's okay. 
All right, that is completely fine. The most important thing is not whether you have one-on-one -on -one research experience with that area, goodness of it. The most important thing is uh, essentially that the narrative is strong. For example, maybe you learned all about in your depression work, all about uh, face morphing technology and eye tracking stuff, right? Okay, and now you want to look at the same thing except in individuals with schizophrenia, for example, okay? Uh, and maybe you want to bring those skill sets to this individual's lab and look into these things, right? Or you ended up learning a lot about altruism or whatever, right, in, you know, one population. Now you want to look at that phenomenon here. So it doesn't have to be demographic and demographic, and it also doesn't have to be clinical phenomenon and clinical phenomenon. Maybe you were working with juveniles earlier for, you know, some condition, and then over here you want to do a PhD looking at juveniles for a different condition. Anything, though, that gets you both research experience, especially if you can get published in a peer-reviewed journal with a good impact factor, uh, as well as conference presentations, as well as uh, practical experience, clinical experience, that is more important. But no, if your target supervisor is interested in a very tiny niche thing, obviously, if you can get experience in that amazing amazing and you should get to know their research very very well does that mean that you need to do that specific research no i worked in a behavioral genetics lab right and that be an individual who supervised me ended up becoming my number one advocate for getting into my dream doctoral program where there was a 0.2 percent acceptance rate right so i i respectfully do not agree with what's being said on this particular point I know a number of people will say, and I see it in statements, that is, I'm really very invested in helping people and supporting people, and so I think the PhD in clinical psychology will help me. And that's great, and that's important work. But an important part of getting a PhD is engaging in research. And it may not seem fair, but individuals actually have to demonstrate that they have some research experience, and more rather than less, um, but individuals have to have some research experience. If, if you're afraid of research or don't have research experience or concerned that research just isn't your thing, there are PsyD programs that do emphasize more so the clinical work than the research. But PhD programs emphasize research. And so if you happen to be seeing this video and you've graduated. This is a great point that she's making. Just one more additional thing. I, I don't want you to think that just because PsyD programs focus less on research, uh, and more on the clinical side, that getting a PhD does not focus heavily on the clinical side because it does. And I don't want you to think that just because you go into a PsyD program that, you know, we can kind of consider ourselves almost like off the hook in terms of research. No, the reason is, is that if you are going to use a clinical technique, you, we don't just use random clinical techniques, right? We use evidence-based clinical techniques. And the evidence there is the peer-reviewed research literature, right? That is what evidence constitutes. Because of that, it's very important to become a conscientious consumer of the peer-reviewed research literature such that you're good enough at stats and good enough at at research methods, even if you can't conduct logistic regression analyses, you should know what that is and basically what it's meant to do. So that this way, if you take a look at how data was collected and how it was analyzed, you can say, yes, that was an appropriate way for this study to be done. Therefore, I personally, as a scholar practitioner, I agree that this does constitute evidence-based best practices. Or you read something, even if it's published in a good journal and say, wait a minute, this, this is just not correct, is wrong. Right. And then you say, even though this is published in the journal, I'm not going to use that technique unless there's more research or whatever that backs this up. OK. And you need to be able to do that. I call it calling bullshit. Right. You have to be able to call bullshit, get good enough at stats and get good enough at research methods so that you can call bullshit. OK. Uh, so I just want to point that out. Just because you're in a PsyD doesn't mean the research is any less important. And just because you're doing a Ph.D. doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to miss out on all these you know, clinical opportunities or you're halfway through your senior year and you have zero research experience, you probably will want to take some time, at least a year, in some volunteer full-time or paid research experience so that you can talk about that and demonstrate your capacity to engage in research. And even importantly, the person who you're working with will be able to write a letter. Obviously, that person would need to have a PhD. Um, but a PhD level researcher who can speak to your involvement in their research lab. Okay, so two things there. The first one is that I do agree that uh, if you have no research experience and you want to apply for a clinical psych PhD, 
Probably not the best idea to do that without first doing a master's or trying to become an internal candidate, which is the best thing you can do. If you want to learn more about that, watch my video on how to become an internal candidate. Um, I respectfully disagree with the idea that the person who writes you the letter needs to be a PhD, but they should be the person who's in charge of the lab. So, for example, you can have somebody, one of my colleagues is insanely well published in social work, right? And she's prof tenured full professor of social work. She's got an MSW, Master's in Social Work, right? Uh, and her work focuses on essentially developmental psychology, except she happens to be a social worker. And she's an amazing professor and amazing researcher, right? Uh, she doesn't have a DSW, which is Doctorate in Social Work, right? So does it have to be a PhD? No. That said, just keep in mind, this should not be, the person who writes you a letter should not be like a grad student in the lab or a postdoc in the lab. No. It should be the head of the lab, which is usually a professor you know, your skills, your level of leadership and things of that nature. So again, GPA, GRE, research experience, but most importantly that your research experience matches with the person that you're interested in. So for me, I'm looking for applicants who have um, engaged in research with African Americans or other marginalized groups who have looked at risk factors, so not just depression or anxiety, um, but also protective factors, so the role of culture and what culture means for psychological well-being. So if an individual applies to work with me, but they have no demonstrated experience in those areas, then they're not going to be as good a fit as someone who has experience in those areas. And given the odds of being admitted into a doctoral program, individuals who are applying want to make sure that they can check off as many boxes as possible, if not all, and to the nth degree, so that they increase their chances of getting admitted into the program of their choice. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Overall, fantastic advice and huge respect and shout out to Dr. Walker. I hope she's doing great. Uh, this video was posted, uh, you know, a number of years ago now in 2018. Uh, but uh, such a nice contribution to the, you know, whatever we would call it, like the academia verse. What would we call it? You guys can tell me in the comments below in terms of YouTube, right? In academia. Um, but uh, big ups, big ups, big respect, big respect to Dr. Walker. Make sure to be able to check out her webpage. Again, the name of this video from Dr. Walker uh, was getting into a clinical psychology PhD program, advice from a professor published in 2018 by Dr. Rita Walker. You can check out her other videos down here. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully that was helpful. I always love listening to other people in the academia verse. What are we going to call it, guys? You let me know in the comments below, and we'll keep it going. All right, guys. Lots of love. Peace to you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.